Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mariela Colon, and I'm a librarian with Chicago Public Library's Adult Services Department. Tonight's virtual program is another in our ongoing series of literary, cultural, and civic programming. Today's event is an author event launch for Summer at CPL. You can visit any of your local library branches to get more information about the programs, events, reading challenges for all audiences, children, teens, and adults. For more information, please check out our website, shypublic.org slash summer. Tonight's event is in the theme of our Summer at CPL programs, which is City of Stories. It's a panel discussion from contributors to the University of Northwestern Press new book, Growing Up Chicago, which is a collection of coming of age stories that reflects the diversity of our great city. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring an online chat for questions from the audience for a brief Q&A following the conversation. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. And it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Roxanne Pilat. Roxanne Pilat was born and raised in Chicago and is currently an adjunct associate professor at North Central College in Naperville. Prior to earning her MA at DePaul University and PhD at the University of Illinois, Chicago, she was a full-time mom of three and worked as a secondary teacher, reporter, and corporate communications consultant. Her work has been published in the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times, and in the recent anthology, Italian Women in Chicago. She's a founding editor of her journal, Packing Town Review. I wanna thank her for leading this discussion tonight with tonight's panelists. And with that, I'm happy to hand the program off to Roxanne. Thank you, Mariella, very much. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of myself, the editors, and the contributing authors of Growing Up Chicago, I welcome you to this very special evening, celebrating the Chicago Public Library City of Stories Summer Reading Initiative. We are delighted you are able to join us tonight in this virtual space, which still seems resistant to our ever evolving pandemic that we're living in. I wanna thank the library team and particularly Mariella Colon for bringing this presentation to you tonight. And I wanna send a call out to the 20 authors who may be listening, whose dynamic work can be found in our newly released anthology. Three of those authors will be featured in tonight's panel, Samira Ahmed, Emil Ferris, and Jesse Ann Foley. Christian Picciolini was also supposed to be joining us tonight, but unfortunately he could not because of health reasons. I also want to introduce my fellow editors, David Schafsma and Lauren DeGiulio Bell, as well as our current student research assistant, Megan Gallardo. We have become, it seems, a village. They are present tonight, uh, but although not pictured on the Zoom, but if you have any questions for them later, please let us know. We want to thank Luis Alberto Urea for setting the tone to our anthology and his thoughtful forward, and also Emil Ferris, who will be speaking with us tonight for her evocative and most memorable cover art. And finally, I'd like to recognize Olivia Aguilar and the entire publishing team from Northwestern University Press. Their talents and efforts have helped us bring this book to life. And this last acknowledgement is very important because this book is about life with all of its demons and delights. Growing Up in Chicago is a book that was truly born of so many creative minds, and its ultimate aim is to honor each person's life represented within. And at the same time, we hope it encourages each of you to share your own stories and to value them as important and necessary. Now I am pleased to introduce the authors who join us tonight, who will each have time to read from and or share thoughts on their work in this collection. And then we will have a conversation. Because I'm an old school teacher at heart, we will go in alphabetical order. So we'll begin with Samira Ahmed. Samira, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of her uh, background. These bios are never enough because these, these authors with us tonight are just so amazing and accomplished. I think they, we need a, a couple of hours on each one to truly represent their accomplishments. Um, Samira was born in Bombay, India and raised in Batavia, Illinois in a house that smelled like onion, garlic and potpourri. 
Ahmed is the best-selling author of Love, Hate, and Other Fi Filters, which is a portion of which is actually included in our anthology. Internment, Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know, Hollow Fires, and the Amira and Hamza series, as well as a Ms. Marvel comic book miniseries. Her poetry, essays, and short stories have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Who Will Speak for America, Color Outside the Lines, Vampires Never Get Old, and A Universe of Wishes. In addition, she is the co-editor of the forthcoming anthology, Magic Has No Borders. Ahmed has also taught high school English in Chicago and New York City, worked in educational nonprofits, and served on political campaigns. Ahmed graduated from the University of Chicago with a uh, joint BAMAT. When she is not reading or writing, she can be found on her lifelong quest for the perfect pastry. Samira, I'd like you to give me some lessons. I, it is, I strongly encourage everyone to have a hobby centered around food. Um, hi everyone, I'm Samira Ahmed. Roxanne, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, CPL um, and Mariela, thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, Chicago Public Library is like is near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm just excited to be here and to talk a little bit about um, my piece in Growing Up Chicago. Um, as Roxanne mentioned, I have an excerpt from my very first novel, Love, Hate, and Other Filters, um, in this anthology. And um, I'm uh, my sixth book is about to come out uh, in a couple months. So um, this first book, I think, as is the case for so many authors, your first novel is kind of um, sort of a, it's always sort of a homecoming to go back to that first book and read a little excerpt from that. And the Love, Hate, and Other Filters actually takes place in my hometown of Batavia, Illinois. And uh, however, in many ways, like me, the, the main character in this novel, Maya Aziz, is very much drawn to um, Chicago. Um, you know, growing up, living in the suburbs, uh, my family and I were in Chicago quite often, largely because in the 70s and 80s, this is where all um, the Indian groceries and Indian food was because we didn't have that in the suburbs yet. Um, and, you know, because we would visit uh, family and friends and stores along um, the Devon corridor. And Chicago for me always had a kind of allure like the big city and it felt vibrant and diverse and in so many ways was very different than the place that I was growing up uh, where I was the only South Asian in the entire high school. Uh, so uh, Chicago always had that draw for me and I personally wanted to come here for for college. So this I'm just going to read a tiny bit from this excerpt from Love, I Hate and Other Filters where Maya is coming to the city. She's staying with her cool aunt um, who lives in Old Town, and it's kind of a, it's a sort of a special scene because it's going to be the moment where Maya has her first kiss, and I kind of, in this excerpt from the novel, just sort of wanted to speak a little bit to the magic of Chicago that a young kid is feeling as they're coming here for this date with, that they're anticipating, and where everything is sort of cinematically perfect. Now we know this amazing city of ours is gorgeous, but it's also flawed. But in this moment for Maya, um, it has that bit of youthful wonder. Um, so this is just a tiny, uh, just gonna read a few paragraphs from that excerpt um, from Love, Hate and Other Filters. Hina meets me at the train station, a squat green glass behemoth that looks too big for a city block. My pocket camcorder raised to my eye. I film the Saturday afternoon crowd entering and leaving. I love how inconspicuous this camera is. It fits in the palm of my hand. As we exit, I turn my lens to the pink banners fluttering from the lampposts. Ads for a fundraising walk for breast cancer in a few weeks. I make sure to capture them on film. Hina designed them. They're all over the city. I'm in awe of her again, as always. I pan down the line of taxis right up until Hina and I enter one. She squeezes my shoulder as I adjust my belt. So glad you're going on a date and doing teenagery things. Try to get into at least a little bit of trouble, okay? And where is this young, dashing Kareem taking you? A fondue place not far from your apartment? Geha's Cafe? He must want to wow you. 
Don't worry, he's not going to pop up a question or anything, I reply coolly, though my pulse quickens. Well, my ride little niece, he's definitely trying to make an impression. And he asked your parents for permission to see you, right? A very suitable boy indeed. The driver pulls up in front of Hina's place. I love my aunt's condo, a two-flat walk-up in Chicago's Old Town neighborhood. To me, it is freedom. Go ahead and get settled in your room. I'll get lunch together. Hina steps into the kitchen while I head down the hall. The comfy bed is piled high with Indian patchwork pillows and rich hues of chocolate, burgundy, and emerald, embellished with tiny mirrors and gold tassels. The raw silk duvet, the raw silk duvet cover is a deep bronze color. A wooden partition carved with intricate floral designs serves as the headboard. It belonged to my grandparents and smells like the sandalwood incense my nanny used to burn day and night. I unpack my dark skinny jeans, the slightly wrinkled black silk camisole I borrowed from Violet. I hang them in the closet. Then I fold my cherry colored cashmere sweater and place it on a chair. After that, I kick off my beat up round toed black plaits and flop onto the bed, turning to stare at the ceiling. Cream is picking me up at seven. That leaves five hours for nervous anticipation. I need to get all the blushing out of my system now. It's been two weeks since we met at the wedding and weirdly, it feels like a million years ago, but also yesterday. We've texted or messaged each other lots, but that also means my contact with Kareem has been virtual and my contact with Phil has been real. But for years, literally years, Phil was neither real nor virtual. He was a faraway dream until now. Only I'm about to go on a date with a guy who is actually available, infinitely more suitable and definitely interested. This is why they invented drugs for heartburn. Thank you, Samir. Um, I love that section too. And I think it, it really speaks to um, a question that I'll probably be bringing up in an extended conversation with each of you is, uh, the, the, the importance of Chicago as a character, if you will, in, in each of your stories and, in, and actually in all of the stories that appear in the anthology. Uh, I love when you talk about the allure of Chicago, that it's cinemat uh, cinematically perfect. It's, it's almost like admiring a celebrity from afar and then you get to be part of it. Could you, could you speak to that a little bit? As far sure. as, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, for Maya, I mean, she's kind of this idealistic young woman and you can tell in this situation, she is sort of crushing on two different guys, but she also sort of has a crush on the city. Um, and I, I love thinking of the cities I live in um, as sort of love interests in a way, um, because She's attracted to this place. It has kind of a mystery about it, this allure. It's a place that she, you know, refers to as having a kind of freedom for her, where she feels like she can be um, more of herself in so many ways. And, you know, that's exactly what you want in, you know, your first boyfriend. <laughs> you want them to have these elements and where you can also be yourself and have, you know, those moments of, um, you know, heart, fluttery, you know, pulse pounding, uh, you know, times in youth. And that's kind of why in, in all of my books, um, not just in my first one, there is, well, in virtually all of my books, every character is either from Chicago or the setting is in Chicago, because for me, Chicago is ever changing. And that's what kind of lends it its dramatic Flair, I think, in, in so many ways. And I just love the pulse of the city. So for Maya, she's sort of feeling the pulse of the city as this young person. And I think how we experience the city changes with age. So for this introduction for her, it's kind of just that, you know, the fresh eyes and wonder of youth and sort of being in love and um, I just wanted to give her this moment because later on in the novel, she faces some pretty tough times. So I wanted to give her this moment of joy in a city that she loves. I really like that, the, that the way that you've expressed that both in your work and, and in your words right now, um, because I think it is so evocative of youth to, you know, find a place, whether, you know, their hometown uh, or a, a city far away that they hope 
that, that they pin so many expectations on that this is a place where I can grow and live and and um, and it will understand me. It'll have something for me. So I think what you're saying does speak to the characterization of Chicago as a uh, sort of as anthropomorphic. You know, it's this it's this um, existence beyond just the concrete and the asphalt. And uh, thank you. That's really. Uh, I think that's a really good start for us. And maybe we can uh, move on to the other authors and then come back together and keep talking about some of these things that come up. Um, so again, in alphabetical order, uh, we will go to Emil. And as I said in my uh, introductory remarks, uh, Emil has created this beautiful color, a cover for us for the, for the anthology. Uh, thank you, Samir. And uh, Emil has, uh, has also, uh, again, well deserving of uh, an entire program unto herself. Um, she is a graphic novelist, uh, let me see if I can do this a little better, uh, whose first book, My Favorite Things is Monsters, has been praised by critics since its publication in 2017. Her book, which presents itself as the lined notebook diary uh, of a preteen self-avowed werewolf who questions her sexual identity, is set also in Chicago in the 1960s, though. Emile was, is now a Guggenheim Fellow for Fine Art, who has exhibited her work extensively in the US and Europe and was most recently honored to teach classes at the Louvre in Paris. Um, she's won many other awards. Her bio is particularly modest. Uh, and I think if I'm correct, Emile, you, your work is part of a newer anthology that's just coming out. And so I don't know if you want to use that as a jumping off place, but we would also lo love to hear you read a bit of your own, uh, your work, which is a unique uh, contribution to this um, anthology because it is actually uh, a, a graphic novel. It's part of a, it's a, a yes, a graphic novel. <laughs> I'm saying that right. Um, so Emil, could you, could you uh, enter in now? Sure. Um, thank you very, very much, Roxanne. And, and thank you, Mariella. And thank you, uh, Samira. It's really nice to be here. Um, it, it's a beautiful event, and I really appreciate the book. And thank you to uh, Lauren and David as well, um, and Olivia. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of places right now in the book. You'll forgive me, I have to put my glasses on. And uh, I'm looking at them and thinking about which one I want to read to you. Now, I will admit to you that reading to you from a graphic novel is almost impossible via this method. So I'm, I'm going to test out something and see if you can see what it is. And if you can't see what it is, then I'm going to talk to you instead. But um, here are pictures. Um, this particular portion of the book is about... Uh, Franklin, who is visiting the Art Institute of Chicago and experiencing, you can see it, you can see it. Well, okay. I'm going to uh, probably not read to you from that place then maybe. I'll read you something shorter and um, maybe pointed. Um, this is, uh, when I wrote my book, I did a lot of research. And one of the things that unfortunately is part of my book um, was sex work, because sex work was very much um, common to the very deprived period of time in Weimar Berlin. There was so much uh, financial economic devastation that um, this was what people turned to in order to support themselves. And uh, so unfortunately, uh, you had something called a pharmacy system, which was a system that uh, was predatory on children. And uh, it's pretty terrible and it's part of the book. Um, but I'm going to show you a picture and then I'm gonna to read to you uh, about it. And um, I think that at this moment in our time on this earth, thinking about the way that women and children are treated is uh, really important. So I'm going to show you uh, this particular picture and it's going to be hard for me to read to you from it, but I will. Um, okay, so this character is Julia and she says, 
When I got back, uh, this is, she doesn't say this, uh, Anka says, when I got back to the pharmacy, Dolly, Julia, was there, but she looked sort of sickly, not well. She spoke in a whisper. How did it go, she said to Anka, who is pictured here, and I don't know that you can see her. So I'm going to make it so that you can. And Anka says, I guess I cured my patient. How was your appointment? Okay. And uh, Julia says, terrible. I wish you'd been here, but it's over now. I'm so tired. And then it says here, Dolly, there's a very bright light moving all about the room, she says. And she looks very pale and really strange. And then she, uh, Anka says, we slept for a few hours. And when I woke up, Dolly was cold, shaking, and her breathing was shallow. I screamed for the big doctor, which is what they call the person who runs the pharmacy. And he carried her away. And then you see this picture um, right here. And I think you can kind of make it out. And he carried her away. It was then that I discovered that Dolly had been bleeding. I'm worried about Dolly. You see Anka here and she's speaking to the big doctor. I need to see her at the hospital. She's not at the hospital and he's got his back to her. So if you're somebody who reads graphic novels, you understand that when a character has their back to you, um, they're hiding something. What is he hiding? Well, he says, where is she? Um, where was she taken? Dolly was taken to a private estate to make her recovery. The big doctor would not look at me while he spoke. He said I would be taken to stay with Dolly as long as I told no one where I was going. And then she's taken to an abbey. And um, this is the abbey. And part of what is... Um, Part of the detective work you have to do when you read a graphic novel is that you have to try to um, bring your emotions to it. So in the picture of the Abbey, it almost looks like two yellow staring eyes are staring at you. And, and all of those things are intentional. The fact that um, the, only, the only color, a bright color on this one particular page is red is also intentional. I'm asking you to look at that, notice it, and it be important. Of course, I'm talking about um, the predation upon children and the fact that uh, children and young women are frequently put in terrible positions. And um, I, uh, I just I put that out there as something that can or cannot be spoken about. But um, I'm very concerned about it personally. I'm very concerned. Um, and the book uh, is talking about these things at a time when not only is um, abortion illegal in Weimar Berlin, and that is the reason that Dolly dies. She dies because um, she can't receive a blood transfusion because it's illegal for her to have received this abortion. So she is simply allowed to bleed to death and she's buried. Uh, that makes me really upset. Uh, that makes me upset because in the book, she's an 11 year old child. Uh, we all we all know that um, there is still is slavery in the world. And we all know that there is still um, predation upon children in our country in these ways as well. And uh, I invite us all to think about what it means uh, to allow people to bleed to death. Uh, I think uh, that's something that is not a discussion I, I think we've had. So the book touches on many things that are relative to today. And uh, I didn't intentionally do that. That was not my choice. But it just seemed to me that these were things that were important still, that they needed to be thought about and spoken about and discussed. So um, that's all I've got for you. Emil, thank you so much. Um, it's a it, it's a sad and, and continually um, neglected reality for so many people and um, and it's it's the the story that you tell is something that certainly has universal 
impact and is one that relates to um, to happenings and events in Chicago. And as you say, in our current history, um, and it is tragic. I think it's one of the things that we aim for and aimed for in the anthology was not to be overly sentimental or overly nostalgic, but to try and include the experiences and um, life, life styles and life events of people who, who may not have experienced things as prettily as some of us may have been privileged to do. So I thank you for bringing, you know, it sort of it creates a, a different perspective from, from each, each story. It reminds me that each of the stories or the essays in the anthology are so unique and so bring out a completely different facet of what happens in Chicago and what, uh, or in any big city for that matter. So, or small city, I suppose. But thank you. That's a, that's a tough thing to present, especially in this format, and uh, and I appreciate its relevancy. Um, we're gonna perhaps we can segue now. Um, I'm not sure if there's an easy way to segue, but we'll segue now to uh, Jesse Ann and to her, you to our final panelist uh, here, and uh, I can introduced her by explaining that she's the, again, could have her own complete uh, uh, two-hour uh, presentation. Jessie is the Prince Honor winning author of the novels, The Carnival at Bray, uh, Neighborhood Girls, uh, Sorry for Your Loss, You Know I'm No Good, and Brita's Island. Her work has been named to best of lists by Kirkus Reviews, book list, uh, Yalsa, Bank Street, Entertainment Weekly, and many other outlets, and has been featured on school and library recommended reading lists across the United States. Jessie lives with her husband and four children on the northwest side of Chicago, which, by the way, is where I was raised, uh, born and raised, where she was born and raised. Um, so, Jesse, welcome, and, and please... Uh, uh, we, we welcome you sharing with us a bit of your work and, um, and maybe your thoughts on uh, your perspective on what you've done. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's great to talk to everybody today. And uh, like Samira said, uh, the Chicago Public Library is also very near and dear to my heart. Um, I think I fell in love with reading, trying to do the summer reading challenge when I was uh, six years old. <laughs> and now I'm doing the same challenge with my own children in the same library, actually. Um, and one of the librarians is still there, which is amazing. Um, but anyway, I'm just, I, I'm really proud to be a part of this anthology. Um, it was really fun for me because I mainly write fiction uh, and I rarely write personal essay anymore, but um, that's what I, I contributed an essay about how my great great uncle uh, killed John Dillinger and um, how we auctioned off the gun in 2009. Um, but I'm, I'm actually gonna read the introduction to the piece. Um, but I also wanna say, I'm just really glad that this anthology exists, especially in this time. Um, you know, for a certain segment of our political population, our city is sort of a shorthand um, for, it, it, I'll, I'll, I don't know how to say this. Um, well, our, our Republican nominee for governor, uh, who just won the nomination last night, uh, has proudly referred to our city as a hellhole. Um, and this is a man who wants to be our governor. So um, while I think that it's um, good and important to acknowledge the flaws of this city, um, I think it's great that we Chicagoans take back that narrative um, and we write about the joys and the beauty and the flaws of our city. And, it, and people who aren't from here, who don't live here, who've never been here, um, they don't have a right to talk about our city um, because they don't understand and they don't care. So I uh, just wanna say that <laughs> real quick. Um, but I'm gonna be reading the, the introduction to my piece. Um, and it's kind of about how 
I really never lived anywhere but Chicago and sort of my ambivalence about that it's a source of pride but also um it's it's a bit more nuanced than that so here we go a couple years ago after scoring a reservation at one of Chicago's hippest new restaurants I texted my mom having dinner in your old stomping grounds she called me immediately are you going to gurney's she asked no I said it's called parachute yes I know that she said impatiently I read about it in Chicago magazine you're talking about gurneys. When I was a kid, I used to do Mary Gurney's grocery shopping for her. She was a bookie who lived on the second floor above the tavern, so it was hard for her to get around. But it's not a tavern anymore, I explained. It's a Michelin starred Korean American restaurant. Huh, she considered this. Well, that's good. I always wondered what would become of that place after Mary's son got murdered behind the counter. Who would have ever guessed that Gurney's would end up with a Michelin star? Sometime around the turn of the 20th century, my great grandparents left the western coast of Ireland to converge on the southwestern coast of Lake Michigan. They settled in neighborhoods that we now call Albany Park and Avondale, but which back then were nameless. They married and found work firemen, school clerks, coffin salesmen. One became the police officer who shot John Dillinger. Most had children, children who traded in the Gaelic lilt of their parents for a nasal bouquet of elongated A's and dropped G's, and in doing so became not just Americans, but Chicagoans. Whether out of necessity or love, they stayed put for three more generations, which is how I ended up 100 years later being affectionately ridiculed for wanting to eat award-winning fusion shared plates at the same place where my grandpa used to drink 60 cent pints of old style. Sometimes when I consider the fact that I've never lived for any significant period of time anywhere but the city of Chicago, I feel proud. This city beats inside of me like blood. It is written in my DNA. How could I live anywhere but here? Other times though, I feel ashamed. Is it really my love for this town, my fierce if unreturned sense of loyalty that has kept me here all my life? Or is it simply a lack of pluck? What would it be like, I sometimes wonder, to live in a place where you are a stranger? Well, it's true I've never had to spend Thanksgiving stuck at an airport or had to troll Craigslist for help moving my furniture. I sometimes crave the delicious anonymity of living in a place where the whisper of memory doesn't trail me everywhere, where I don't care about changing neighborhoods or bandwagon sports fans or someone using the word soda with a straight face, where I can even go to the grocery store without running into at least three people I know. But then maybe these are the kinds of thoughts that everyone has, transplant or not. We all want the thing we can't have, like a Chicago parking spot carved out of a blizzard and marked off with lawn chairs and overturned paint buckets. The transient crave roots and the rooted crave movement. We are all hemmed in by the limitations of our humanness, each one of us with our small and precious allotment of one single life. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jesse. That's a wonderful like uh, cameo of, of that could be universalized for so many different ethnicities, but you've made it so specific to your own background and, and upbringing. And I, and I think that um, uh, I, I think that the uh, the impact of what you're saying really, again, relates to the notion of uh, a couple of things. Um, the, the, the sort of, not only the allure that, that Samira spoke of, of the city, uh, but also uh, the kind of loyalty that I, that I see in so many people who have grown up in Chicago, as, as, particularly in people who have chosen to stay in Chicago, but, but also those who kind of cling on to, I spent the first, you know, uh, into my teenage years into Chicago, but I still feel like a, a real deep connection to the city. And, um, and I see that in a number of our writers, in a number of our you know, various authors who have written into us, um, and a number of people that I read, and I think the loyalty that emerges out of um, um, out of this existence, and I, and I wonder about it because I don't know if that's a common thing for most uh, uh, for for most uh, um, 
for most citizens, uh, citizens of other cities, you know, so it's something that we can find out. But um, I think it really speaks again to this notion of both allure and, and loyalty. Maybe you can uh, expand on that in, in your own, you know, experiences, perhaps. Um. Well, I don't know because I've never lived anywhere else. <laughs> oh, well, but um, I do think like, so for example, my, my brother lives in Portland, Oregon, um, and there is a lot of civic pride there, but it's different because it's such a like city on the make right now. And there's so many people, you know, he was saying to me, it's, it's rare that you find somebody living in Portland who's actually from Portland. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think, and, and I would say the same with New York too, you know, obviously there are a lot of native New Yorkers, but it's such a global city. Mm -hmm. um, and Chicago is too, but uh, I, I don't know if Emil and Samira can speak to that, but I mean, we, we, we're the type that makes sure we say it, we're a global city, yeah. <laughs> you know? So we have that, you know, chip on our shoulder kind of thing. Yeah, I think that, that that's a valuable observation. Another thing I noticed, and maybe we can now enter into the sort of the, just open conversation part of this is um, it seems that each of you have touched on a certain political aspect of existence uh, in, in your work. And um, I think for you, Jesse, yours kind of touches on the kind of uh, in the in the quest for in, in your story, Dillinger, which I did not get to uh, name your story. Um, you. It, it, it's sort of a quest within the family, a hope for uh, finding some economic uh, input that they hadn't previously enjoyed. And so they, uh, uh, without giving away the story, um, they, so it, it's a story of economics in a way, of, of, of economic um, uh, uh, position in a community. And, um, and that has a political kind of underpinning to it. Uh, uh, Samir, I see that in your piece, I, you know, I, the, the, uh, the dreams and, and angst and, um, uh, and yearnings of a young woman who is, um, negotiating her, her own family's kind of principles and mores with the, the, the identity of herself that she's hoping to create or to live up to. And, uh, and that has a political, more of a personal political sense. And Emil, with yours, certainly the, the, the political notion of how do we protect our most vulnerable uh, members of our society, you know, all of those are political uh, aspects of, um, of, of writing. So I, I hadn't thought about this before as much, but do you think that, um, that do, you, do you deliberately set out as you start to work on a piece thinking of um, an issue that is kind of prompting you or responding? I don't know if there's, I can't say generally, but is, is, that a, is there a moment in your writing where you become aware of some um, political aspect of your writing and then you expand on it accordingly? Does that resonate at all? Um, um, I think that just, it's a good question because I think that uh, drama, uh, fiction, uh, relating a drama or something that has a dramatic quality to it, contention, uh, difficulty, whatever, is going to naturally underscore a political issue. I mean, it almost always is going to have some dimension politically. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at uh, both uh, Samira and, and uh, uh, Jesse, and I'm thinking, I get that. That, that's, that really lives for me, the idea of um, coming to a different place and having these ghosts of your, of your ancestral or ethnic past that, you're, that you carry with you maybe manifest in some ways, you know, like I love the description of the, the bed and, and, and it's, it's mirrors and it's colors and it's tassels. And yet, you know, this is a person living in this place at this time, dealing with these issues. And, you know, the same, I, mean, I totally identified with Jesse's piece 
I love that line about coming from, you know, the, the, this Irish coast to this other coast, you know, I, I just really enjoyed all that. And I could really identify with it. And I think there's the natural amount of drama in, in that, uh, when you talk about that, um, you know, I'm reading a piece that has happened in Weimar Berlin, but I will relate to, you know, um, you know, there will be future material that covers uh, some of these echoes from the past, these situations that don't seem to leave us, that we seem to be dealing with again and again. So I think the dramatic, the underscoring uh, uh, is, is very universal. I, I could see anybody really understanding what Samira and what Jesse were saying about uh, coming from somewhere else, uh, maybe ancestrally, and then and settling and carrying with all of that baggage, good and bad and, and interesting. You know, I, I can definitely see that. And that's in my book as well. You know, if you've read it, you know that too. So uh, yeah, I, I just think it's natural. I think when people say something is political, I think it's not really political. It's just more, um, it's more what we're living with. We're living with uh, challenge and, and uh, it might take that form, you know? I mean, I, I think, sorry, I was just gonna quickly respond to that. I mean, I think all art is political. Like my entire existence is politicized, not even by me. I mean, I'm a brown Muslim woman who lives on the South side of Chicago. Every single one of those things, um, you know, what Jesse was talking about earlier, how Chicago is used, I live on the South side. It's, the word Chicago is used as a racist dog whistle. That's exactly what it is. Um, I am also South Asian, a child of immigrants. I'm a Muslim. Literally everything I write is political. Like there's, I don't have a moment where I think about it because it is, it is, period, I guess. Um, and I think when, you know, artists say their art isn't political, that's actually a political statement because I don't believe in neutrality in art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a really important point to make. And I, um, um, and I, and I'm watching the time a little bit, cause I know that we have a couple of minutes left. So I don't know, Jesse, if you want to add anything in or Samira or Emil, if you want to, you know, um, add anything extra here, but. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I just think those are, are wonderful comments. Um, and yeah, like what Samira is saying, like to not even have a choice about, um, being politicized um, because, and I, I think back to Emile's piece, um, like when you wrote that, I'm sure you, you know, you're setting this piece in 1960s, uh, not Berlin, but I, in Germany. Um, but, you know, and this exact same thing is going to be happening to 11 year old girls here in 2022 America. Um, because of the political decisions that have been handed down. So like, um, you know, you're being prescient without even realizing it. And I think um, we just have such an obligation to, yeah, I mean, how can you say that your art is not political? Like, then why are you, why are you doing it? Yeah. <laughs> if it's not political, then maybe it's just entertainment and not art. But I think even entertainment is, is political. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think we have just maybe a minute left before, or are we at the question and answer period? I'm not sure. Okay, ah, here we go. We're at the question and answer place. So um, if you have your chat uh, spaces open, uh, Samira, I think there's a question for you. There's about uh, 10 minutes we have so we can entertain some questions now from the audience and we don't have to continue with the the political theme but there is a question to start with uh samira you're being asked is chicago a unique character in your stories or do other cities make appearances in your work in the same way uh so chicago um in this first novel, I mean, other filters, it takes place in a small town, Batavia, but there's a like few key scenes in Chicago. Um, my next uh, novel in tournament is the one novel that is actually not set in Chicago um, because it's set in um, an internment camp for Muslims in the desert of California. Um, Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know is about a young Southside uh, South 
girl teen who is very interested in being an art historian and dreams of going to the Art Institute. Um, but most of that takes place in a summer she is in Paris. And that's where that pastry love comes in because I did a lot of research <laughs> to get the pastries right in that book. Um, critical. Um, and um, Hollow Fires, my most recent book, actually also takes place entirely on the South Side. And this the city is a very, very important part of that um, novel. And in my middle grade books, um, the kids are also from the South Side of Chicago. And even in Miss Marvel, even though Miss Marvel is from New Jersey, since I um, was writing this comic book miniseries, the first issue is set in Chicago because I wanted to, every um, South Asian has a cousin in Chicago and I give Miss Marvel one too. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, okay, this is addressed to everyone. Uh, how is your writing being influenced by our current state of this state of affairs, especially as it pertains to women characters? Ooh. Ooh. So, if you each want to take a moment to think about that, and uh, then we can. Uh, who would Who would like to go first? Um, well, I can just say I have a, my first middle grade novel is coming out um, in two weeks, actually, July 12th. It's called Brita's Island. Um, and one of the things that it touches upon is um, undocumented Irish immigrants. Um, it's, I feel a lot of different ways about this because um, there are plenty of undocumented Irish immigrants. It's a small country, um, but they are here but um, because they're white and native English speaking, um, they're not re really ever part of the conversation. Um, they sort of get a pass. Um, and so, you know, I just, um, I try to write from my own perspective and my own point of view, um, but I think it's, it's difficult and it's been hard for me to see how many Irish Americans um, hold really intolerant views towards immigration. Um, well, at the same time, they'll be marching in their St. Patrick's Day parades, which is essentially a, a celebration of immigration. Um, and yet, and, and they like to hold themselves as these underdogs. You know, we, we escaped the famine, you know, 150 years ago and, and uh, without ever acknowledging that, um, that the, the, just the total hypocrisy of their um, stance. So um, that that's not the point of the book, but it's just something that I has been on my mind for a long time. And so it sort of made its way into the novel. Thank you. Anyone else? Like to add in? You know, I have forthcoming material that long before things that were happening now, uh, we're dealing with um, really some of what we're, we're looking at right now for women. And, uh, you know, I'm always asking myself as I write these characters, I'm always listening to my own misogyny uh, because if you've been raised in a culture, you can hear it in yourself, um, especially from my generation where I remember, you know, uh, it was a big deal for a woman to have a checking account you know, I mean, it's like women today don't quite know about that. Um, I hate to say it, but, you know, there was a time when um, inheriting anything, having a job that wasn't teacher, nurse or, or secretary. I mean, there, there were so the, the glass ceiling was just right about here for most women, you know. Um, and so. Yeah, I, I listen for my own misogyny and I and unfortunately I find it and I hear it. So I would say to, uh, I, I'm not, I can't be too judgmental when I see uh, funny things, even the New Yorker recently had something about what's with these women's bodies and how do they work? And it was a piece written by two men. It was a comedy piece, but I thought it was really uh, kind of delightful. And I, find, I found things in it that I thought, yeah, that's just, you know, some of the things you think sometimes are just a little ways away from that. And isn't it funny and strange that we are, so inculcated and uh, so claimed by a society that hates us so much and yet depends on everything we do uh, and everything we think and of course all that we write. And uh, you know, it's, just, it's a little disappointing. Uh, I won't judge anyone, 
but I really would ask people to challenge themselves. And, uh, you know, I, I think the people that need to start challenging themselves are, are um, they're clearly uh, in high places. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. We'll switch to a whole different topic and maybe just finish up with this last question. It's, it's a shorter one for each of you. Just a quick answer. What's your favorite part of Chicago that most people might not know about yet? Well, I'll jump in with a shout out to the South Side, which is people um, don't go to Jackson Park enough and around uh, right behind the Museum of Science and Industry, there are um, cherry trees that blossom in the spring and it is absolutely gorgeous. And I just um, strongly encourage people to come out and, and, and check out that entire area because it's been, it's changed a lot over time. It was, it, you know, that everything around the Museums of Science and Industry was originally built for the World's Fair. And now there's been, um, you know, a lot more preservation of the, the prairie around there and you know it's a gorgeous place for a bike ride and uh, there's a Yoko Oto sculpture there as well which is I believe I don't know if this is correct but one of her few public um, works of sculptural art that's that's there for everyone right by this awesome Japanese garden so I encourage folks to come out here. Thank you thank you. Jesse, Emil, maybe you don't want to share it because you don't want to. I don't mind, but I was going to give Jesse a chance. Um, yeah. So, well, I uh, I remember one summer a couple of years ago. I I had three young children at the time, and I had this plan that I was going to we were going to try to visit every single park. Uh, and then I found out how many parks there actually are in Chicago. And uh, we, we went to a lot. But one of my favorite parks uh, is Indian Boundary Park in West Rogers Park. Um, they have these wonderful little, I guess they used to be sw uh, houses for swans. So they're these like little wooden houses that kids can go into. And my kids just loved it. Um, there's this awesome sprinkler, um, really cool playground. And it's just a really, really fun spot. And then also because I am a far Northwest sider, I have to plug Superdog, um, which <laughs> really has the best. So um, if you're a hot dog person, come to Superdog. <laughs> it's one of my favorites too. Um, and Emil? Well, I, I kind of love the libraries at the Art Institute of Chicago. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. had a chance to go to them. Well, you folks have, but a lot of people haven't. And, um, you know, I, I actually really enjoy taking kids to um, the Thorn Rooms uh, and, and showing them, you know, those small rooms. Uh, I did a bad thing when I used to be at the Art Institute. I used to kind of purloin, we shall say, which I think is a good word, um, the tickets uh, they used to give away to the adults, to the parents of the kids who might be going there. And I'd kind of purloin, purloin a stack of those and I'd give them out in front of the Art Institute to tourists who were just passing and were not like, did not feel uh, particularly like they had the right. And sometimes it's based on color and sometimes it's based on class, you know and uh, you know finances, because it's become quite expensive to go there. But if you give somebody, if there's a family of five from Iowa and you give them five tickets and you say, these tickets are worth $20 a piece. First of all, they, they look around thinking that I, this is a scam because everybody knows it's Chicago. I mean, it's a, you know, it's like what Jesse was saying, which is so absolutely right. And, and also what Samira was saying, absolutely right. But you know, they would go in, I would watch them walk up those steps, looking behind them, like something bad was going to happen to me. I was going to, or happen to them. I was going to jump and maybe I was going <laughs> to do something to them, but they would go in. And I would say to them a lot of the time, start out at the thorn rooms, because this is a very relational place for them. And then of course, everything is there. Every painting, so many paintings that are really um, very iconic American paintings are, and worldwide paintings are in this place. And I just got so excited walking away from that. And uh, so I would always say the thorn rooms. I, I just enjoy the heck out of looking into those little, little tiny rooms. Um, and uh, it's, 
it's such a simple pleasure. You know, it's, it's ridiculously simple. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I think we need to start working towards concluding now. And I just want to thank you all again, uh, Emil, Jesse, Samira. You've just been wonderful, uh, you know, participants and your open and honest comments, I, I think are just really inspiring. And, um, and thank you again, Mariella. Um, Christian, we hope you feel better. And um, we want to uh, just end on a note here of uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if anyone has, uh, you know, wants to check us out on the web, you can find us just Google Growing Up Chicago. And also on Facebook, we have a Facebook site. Um, and we have other events coming up this year. So we'll be happy to, uh, you know, keep things posted so that you can uh, maybe join us again with a, a different group of authors. And, um, but uh, we're asking if, uh, and this is uh, actually coming from Mariella, I think it's wonderful to, um, ask each of you to just describe your upcoming works again. That would be great. If you can just tell us what, what, what's next in the hopper for us to look forward to reading from each of you. Uh, Samira, you wanna start? Sure, well, today is actually the publication day for my uh, graphic novel bind up of Miss Marvel, which is just all the five issues of the miniseries put together. And that's called Miss Marvel Beyond the Limit. And it's at comic book shops and your bookstores. And this September 20th, my second book in my middle grade fantasy series, Amira and Hamza, The Quest for the Ring of Power, um, <laughs> comes out. It's a fantasy adventure with two bickering siblings um, that starts um, on the south side of Chicago and begins, um, their adventure begins in Jackson Park. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Jesse. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, my um, I've written four books for young adults, but my first middle grade novel is out uh, on July 12th from Quill Tree Books. It's called Brita's Island. Um, it's available for pre-order wherever you buy books. Um, and then in December, my first picture book is coming out, which I co-wrote with my sister, Nora Morrison. Um, it's called Agatha May and the Anglerfish. Um, it's a STEM book about a little girl with an obsession with the deep sea anglerfish. Um, my sister used to be a scuba diver at the Cleveland Aquarium. Um, and then I'm also closing in on uh, finishing up my first novel for adults, but I can't say much more about that right, right now. Thank you. And Emil? You're muted. You have to unmute, please. Um, I have actually, um, I've, I've uh, reanimated a dead body and um, no, I haven't, I was lying. <laughs> lying. Um, but, I, but I wish I had, and I am actually going to be reanimating some projects that I started years and years ago. So that's kind of what uh, the same thing. It's my Frankenstein stuff. I can't tell you too much, although you may find out about it sooner than you wanted to. <laughs> okay, that's, all I've got. that's wonderful. Exciting. Thank you all again so much. I'm going to give you to Mariella. And thank Mariella, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Roxanne. Um, that's all the time we have this evening. I want to thank our panelists and, and Roxanne for leading such a great discussion. The book again is called Growing Up Chicago, and you can check it, check it out at the Chicago Public Library or any of your other local libraries but we also encourage you to visit any of Chicago's many independent bookstores to purchase a copy. Tonight's program will be available on Chicago Public Library's YouTube and Facebook page. If you have friends who weren't able to join us tonight, please invite them to watch Down Demand. Please visit the Chicago Public Library website for many more upcoming virtual events at shypublib.org. Thank you again to our speakers and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Have a great night and stay well. Good night. <laughs>